Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert. Today I'm joined by Tony Kornmeyer, Lead Product Developer from DQ. Tony, thanks for joining today. Hi Grace, thanks for having me. So I'd like to start off by asking a little bit more about your background and how you got into the accessibility field in the first place. Well, my background kind of comes from an opportunity that I had five or six years ago when I was looking for a job and you know, I kind of got presented the opportunity to work at DQ and you know, I didn't really know a lot about accessibility at that time. You know, I've been, you know, maybe adjacent to it with other things that I've done in, in the past, you know, and I actually, it's funny because I thought I knew about accessibility and a little bit of knowledge that I, I had but through that opportunity. You know, it was, it was an intriguing prospect for me because, you know, I'm a, a parent of children that, that have disabilities and, you know, it's near and dear subjects, you know, to me and my family. When I was met with that opportunity, you know, I, I found it you know, like very intriguing. I was like, you know, hey, this, this seems like a really good fit for me. And so, you know, I began working at DQ and I was just blown away by how much I didn't know about accessibility and just how deep of a subject it is. And the more I kind of got kind of like dug in and, you know, really started to embrace the subject matter, I, I didn't know 50% of, let's say the web, you know, there's this whole other side of it where, you know, when you're talking about accessibility and, and applying it to some of your different things that you do as a developer, it, it's incredibly deep subject matter and very specific type of topics and you know, knowledge set that you have to have. Working for DQ and having access to, you know, all the experts and, and different folks that work here and that I've met through the community, it's just been a great journey for me and it's really fulfilling to feel like I contribute to that space. Absolutely. And I think it's so true of, of how deep and how broad the subject matter goes in accessibility. It's certainly a subject area that really keeps you on your toes and it really helps you continue to learn as long as you're dealing with that subject matter. It's quite expansive. So since you've joined DQ, and I think you, you mentioned to me that you've been at DQ for at least five years now, you've held a couple of different positions before now as a lead product developer. So what can you kind of tell us about the projects that you're involved in right now? Yeah, so the project that I'm working on right now, you know, we've kind of built this new team around uh, reporting and dashboarding. We're focused on pulling together a bunch of different report type data from the different products so we can report on things and can have like a nice uh, kind of cohesive view of, of what's going on, get like a nice picture of uh, accessibility, you know, in your organization. Yeah, we're excited about it. And I think it's going to be a really good addition to the already deep product suite that we have. Absolutely. So going back for just a moment, Tony, you mentioned how before you started at this position at DQ, you had some experience with accessibility that you were kind of adjacent to it, but it wasn't until you really got into the subject matter that you realized, again, how, how deep the accessibility field goes. So knowing that, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in accessibility who might have been in a similar position as you? Yeah, that's a good question. When you're just starting out and, you know, you kind of start understanding how deep the subject goes, some of the easiest things that you can do that can start, you know, really kind of connecting the dots from a developer standpoint is, you know, utilize tools to access extension where pull it down, run this tool on your application, code that you're currently developing, and kind of start seeing where those different accessibility issues live and you know what they are. The nice thing about some of the tools that you know we have at DQ is it gives you a bunch of information about what that issue is, why it's problematic. And you know, so just like from a starting out type of, of point of view, you know, you go from maybe learning what types of issues there are, different techniques that you could use to, to fix those issues, and kind of understand too, like, you know, like a cause and effect type of scenario, like where, you know, if I create a bit of code, 
that is missing some different attributes or developed in a way that it, it's not accessible for folks. Then, you know, I think like as you start out, you can start building that knowledge and, and you know, kind of understand what makes code accessible. You know, there, there's other really great resources out there that people can use. You know, like our, our DQ University site has a ton of great info and in different classes and you can go through different subjects and, and understand some of those topics in, at a much deeper level. There's a lot of information out there. And then, you know, like looking at the WCAG guidelines, you know, there's free resources in which, you know, you can go and look at some different very pointed guidelines around how certain controls or, or components are, are supposed to behave. And those are great resources, you know, especially if you're just starting out. So even with a myriad of resources out there, it can still be challenging to get all of your developers and team on board with practicing accessibility, especially if it's new and they've never done it before. Accessibility to many people when they're not familiar with it can absolutely feel daunting. So in your experience, what have you found to be a good motivator for developers to get involved in accessibility? I think the first motivator that I would talk about is, you know, like one, it's, it's the right thing to do, right? There's so many people, you know, like the, the accessibility space, you know, it talks about just being equal across the board and, you know, everybody essentially being able to access the same type of resources and, and have, you know, the same type of digital quality that we talk about a lot at DQ, right? So for, for that, having empathy for the, you know, your users, you know, understanding how code that's not accessible impacts people, I think is like one of the first things. One of the things that we see a lot, you know, is unfortunate is that, you know, like shipping that code to, you know, can also lead to lawsuits for your company and liability that exists out there. So, you know, that's one of the, the big motivators that we've seen. Uh, but the other one, you know, that I would say, you know, for developers specifically is just that when you are shipping good code that is accessible, it's kind of like mastering your craft. You know, there's, there's certain techniques that you work on in your different coding languages that, you know, you're writing good, concise code that, you know, works really well, but it's not completely done unless, you know, you've got accessibility, you've taken that into consideration, testing for it, and, you know, you're just making sure that your application is able to be used by, by everybody. I think as a motivator, wanting to ship good code and be more of a complete developer is, is you know, really good motivation. Absolutely. And I think the impact on the end user and using empathy as you've described is a fantastic way to start getting in that headspace of wanting to practice accessibility. And shifting gears a little bit from that, you've talked about in the past what accessibility overlays are and how JavaScript overlays are different than the kinds of toolbar overlays that you, that you often see. Can you describe again what the difference is between those two and why you think organizations should avoid the toolbar kind of accessibility overlay? Yeah, absolutely. So blog posts, you know, I, I've got a blog post out there on, and, you know, speaking specifically about this topic, one of the things that we find with the, uh, the toolbar type overlays is that, you know, they, they're incredibly limited with some of the different types of issues that they can fix. You know, they've got very canned functionality. So, you know, you might only get your color contrast, a couple different things like focus indicators, and those as a solution are very limited to the scope of some of the other things that could be happening on your website. So, you know, to kind of consider that as one of the, the tools that you would employ on a site or, or maybe the only tool that you're employing on the site, you know, there's like a big gap there from what total solution would be like where you've got pretty close to 100% coverage across the board, you know, like on some of these issues. And, you know, the toolbar type solutions just don't really get it. And to contrast it with 
our Amiz product at DQ, which, you know, like I've, I've worked a lot with, you know, as I first started out here at DQ, that was one of my first projects that I was involved with. And, you know, the, the difference that Amaze has, like when you compare it to those toolbars, is that our overlays are completely customizable. They interact with the way that your site works. And, you know, we can fix things like keyboard interactions and, you know, different listeners that you might have on different pages, like buttons that aren't really buttons, you know, you know, like, like a toolbar would not be able to fix without some kind of custom programming or something like that. So I would say Amaze overall is, is a much better fit to get a more complete type of uh, solution. And the biggest plus there is that DQ developers don't need access to to the source code. You know, this is an overlay. It's built kind of like in isolation and it just kind of interacts with the way that the site is as it's rendering. So a lot of pluses with that, you know, I mean, obviously I'm very biased because I've got a lot of experience in that space, but when, when you look at the results and look at some of these other solutions that are out there, I fully believe that what we have here is a better solution. Yeah, absolutely. I think a big point that I'm hearing there is by utilizing those simple fix overlays is that you really are leaving out a lot of issues. I mean, that you, it's covering a certain amount, which is a step forward in making your site accessible, but it still leaves a big gap in what a user would be experiencing on the site where the accessibility issues fixed in a more complete way. So looking back on your career as a developer, what is it about accessibility that you wish you'd known? Or what was a big takeaway that you've gained from your time in the accessibility world? Oh, that's a good question. So what I wish I would have known is just that there is so much more. And I mean, honestly, looking back, given the times, you know, I've I've been a developer now for about 15 years. And as a subject matter, you know, when I first started out, it was something that like I, I didn't really know existed for the most part. I think like in the last five plus years, you know, I think it's gone, you know, it's, it's definitely gained a lot more like notoriety, you know, you see it popping up like in some of these tools that, you know, you use like in things like Chrome and part of like the mainstream discussion, like for the most part. So, you know, I think like one, you know, I just wish I would have known more about it, you know, when I was first starting out or what some of the different resources were that, you know, I could go and teach myself more about some of those different, you know, techniques and what, what it really meant to program something that was uh, accessible. As I've gotten into that and, you know, I've, I've learned more about it, you know, now for me, it's, it's more just like spreading the word and, you know, making people more aware, putting content out there for folks to understand the things that I've learned over the course of my career as, as a developer that's, you know, very specialized in this, this space now. So overall, I mean, I think now that it's gotten a lot more exposure and and people are more aware of it. I think it's it's great because the more aware you are of it as a subject and exposed to you like through the, the dev tools and, and things like that, you know, you, you're just gonna pick it up. You know, you're just gonna kind of absorb it as you go. So, you know, I think folks that are starting out now have a, a big advantage in the way that this type of information is uh, just right there at your fingertips. And you don't really gotta dig too far or, you know, look for it to specifically to find the information that you need and develop the code that is, is going to be beneficial for people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point that, you know, you've seen accessibility grow from being kind of a fringe subject matter to now much more mainstream. And certainly the more prevalent something is, the more visible it is, the easier it can be for people to adopt and start practicing it. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, it's about time that folks are really giving it the attention that it deserves. I think it's a great time to be like inaccessibility just in general. Yeah, it's really encouraging to see. So Tony, uh, last question for you here. You've worked with many organizations 
over the years, helping them to manage their accessibility development work. What's a common issue or theme that you see crop up across organizations and what advice would you give them? That is, what is something that you wish organizations knew when it came to managing and practicing accessibility? Well, when it comes to organizations and their journey with accessibility, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, kind of different categories that they fall into. And, you know, a lot of the, the type of companies that we start working with and engaging with are early on in their accessibility journey. So, you know, when the maturity level is low, you know, typically what we, what we look to see, you know, and the advice that we give is to, you know, try to bake it into their process, you know, so in the development process, you know, we, we've got this thing that we say all the time that we do about shifting left and trying to get accessibility testing built into day-to-day -day development activities. So, you know, like ultimately like what that means is, you know, give your developers the ability to test for accessibility, you know, like give them the tools, you know, make sure that those tools are getting baked into your automated tests. And the more that you can do that and, and bake that type of process into your, your development process, what tends to happen is it starts finding issues. And, you know, this is also something that then gets built into your process. So, you know, you start treating accessibility issues just like you do above that QA found and, you know, you got this component that doesn't quite work right, but at the same time, you've got the ability to identify that there's, you know, accessibility issues with that same component. So, you know, if you can start flushing out those issues sooner and start putting that information in the hands of your developers, what tends to happen is those issues get fixed sooner in the process and it's largely beneficial to the whole organization. And, you know, anytime that you can fix those issues sooner in the process, it costs way less as you take it through, you know, the, the life cycle of an application that you are, you've got this like short feedback loop that got your developers focused on these accessibility issues. And it's, it's great to flush that out and, and create a really strong process that is repeatable. And as you bring new developers on, you know, this is just part of what it is now, you know, to do development at your organization. So seeing that a lot and, you know, being in a bunch of different places where, you know, we've, we've started to create these types of programs with people, you know, I think it just comes back down to tooling and, and processes and building real good habits and trying to make that as, uh, as repeatable as, as you possibly can. Definitely. And I can imagine it's really rewarding to see accessibility programs taken from such a young stage to one that's functioning at full force with tools and processes and good habits, as you mentioned. It is, it is really great. And it's, it's neat to kind of see, you know, after, you know, a couple of years going back and, and talking to folks and just, you know, just see how, you know, the, the, the landscape has changed and, you know, the way that they talk about accessibility issues, like in a different way. Well, Tony, thank you so much for chatting today. I really appreciate your insights and your perspectives on development and the accessibility field as a whole. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Grace.